I was 18 years old. I'd gone to the States on a sports scholarship. I was the world's worst boxer. But I thought I was great. Um, sport was my life. I remember my coach saying to me, Giles, you take a punch really well. At 18, you still think that's a compliment. Um, but sport was everything for me. And I was in the States and had a minor car accident. But it was enough that my knees were damaged and I was told I would never do sport again. I came back to London. I was in hospital here. And I was an incredibly angry young man. I was very frustrated that everything I'd worked towards, all this sport, had been taken away from me. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And that's when something, a small gift really, a, a very small gesture, was to change my life forever. My godfather passed away. And he left me his Olympus OM-10 camera and a book by the war photographer Don McCullen. Now, I grew up in a house, my parents weren't that interested in art or the news or media, and I had never seen photographs like Don McCullen's, these black and white images from the wars in Biafra, Bangladesh, Vietnam. And I looked through these photographs, and they had such an impact on me. To this day, if I shut my eyes, I can still remember those first images I saw of Don's. And lying in that hospital bed, I knew this is what I was going to do with my life. I had finally found it. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So I actually taught myself photography lying in a hospital bed. I would photograph all the doctors and nurses, my friends. I was 18 years old, so mainly I photographed the nurses. But I taught myself the basics of photography there, and I left full of good intentions to follow in the footsteps of Don McCullen. But I got a bit sidetracked. Um, I had some friends that were in bands, um, they asked me if I'd come along and photograph their gigs, um, and I kind of enjoyed doing that. And before I knew it, magazines were ringing me up and asking me to go and photograph bands. Um, and so, in the middle of the 90s, a great time for music in, in Britain, I found myself right in the middle of the music world. It was great. I worked with bands like Oasis and Blur, Prodigy, Underworld, um, Marilyn Manson, Lenny Kravitz, Mariah Carey. It was an amazing experience. I remember my uh, Auntie Margaret. She's a very stern Scottish woman. She's quite scary. And we sat there on Christmas Day, and she was looking through some of my photographs, and she said, Giles, I thought you wanted to be a serious photographer. She goes, what went wrong? She said, why are you doing this? And I said, I've got to be honest, Auntie Margaret. I am doing this for the beautiful women and great parties. And she said, seriously? And I said, I'm 20 years old. That's a legitimate reason for a career path. And at that stage, it really was, and I loved it. I had an amazing time. But as the years went on, I found myself increasingly unhappy. And I couldn't really figure it out. I seemed to have this amazing life. I worked for Vogue, GQ. I was, uh, say, hanging out with all these kind of movie stars, and models, and actors. But I would do a shoot, and I'd find myself going to my hotel room almost in tears because I didn't feel happy. And it made no sense to me. How could I have all of this and be unhappy? And as the years went on, that unhappiness grew. And by the time I was in my late 20s, I was really struggling. I also had a problem with the way that women were portrayed in a lot of the magazines I worked for. At that time, it was always a man in a suit and a woman in her underwear. And as a photographer, I grew really uncomfortable with that. And in the end, it came to a climax. I was doing a shoot in the Charlotte Street Hotel in Soho. Uh, there was an argument going on between a young actress, the editor of a magazine, um, and her agent about her state of undress in this shoot. And sitting there, I suddenly thought, this is not why I became a photographer. So the rock and roll story is that I took my cameras and I threw them all out the window of the Charlotte Street Hotel. Anybody that knows me knows I'm not with that rock and roll. I'm more of a Radio 4 guy. So I had a little hissy fit, I threw them on the bed. It's just unfortunate they bounced out the bed and out the window. <laughs> and let me tell you, Mamiya RZ turns out it makes a big crack in a pavement. Um, so that was really, I thought, the end of my photographic career. I was only 28 years old, um, I moved out of London, um, I got a job in a bar, um, and really sunk into a very, very deep depression. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. Um, I wanted to tell you this story, uh, Ukraine, 
2010. This is a kind of transformation story for me, is when I really became more of a storyteller than just a photographer. I'd gone there to do uh, a story on street kids. Um, I'd heard a lot about uh, the way that they were living, that a lot of them had come from former parts of Russia to live in Ukraine. When they got there, they only found poverty. They couldn't get access to healthcare or education. Um, so they were living in abandoned buildings. So this was one group that I got to know. Um, some people would call them a gang. I called them a family. They were a kind of dysfunctional family, but they operated like this little family. At the front is uh, Sasha, who was the leader of the gang with his girlfriend. They lived in this abandoned building. You know, most of the time, it was just boredom. Um, it's one of the things, again, that I've realized I'm very interested in. Boredom. It sounds a strange thing to say, but people are always looking for the most dramatic images. Actually, most of life is stuck in the middle. Somebody recently described my photographs in a review where they said that he is the master of capturing boredom. And I took that as such a compliment because that's often where the stories lie, especially with the work you see here of refugees. Most of their life is stuck in limbo. So many of the photographs I take are little details, people brushing hair, holding hands, the little intimacies of daily life. I mean, of course, in this place, there was a lot of alcohol and drug abuse. A lot of them came from abusive homes that they often followed those patterns. But what I saw was often tenderness and the way that they looked after each other. This is when one of the young girls had cut herself and the others were tending to the wound, disinfecting it. Often, they were just there sweeping up. I always say this is a photograph that really deeply disturbs me. It's funny because it's just a picture of a girl sweeping up. Another photographer might have shown the picture of them injecting drugs, but this upsets me more because this reminded me that this was just a young girl who wanted normal life and that every day they would try and turn their little squat into something that resembled a home. I'd been told these kids were worthless, that they had no interest in any of this, and that's what I saw. On the last day, they took me out um, to the Black Sea to have a sort of farewell celebration before I left. Um, we were there, uh, Sasha, the leader of the gang, he comes up to me, he puts his arm around my neck, and he goes, you, me, swim. I was like, oh, I'm not really feeling it, mate. He's like, you, me, swim. Now, whenever I go traveling, obviously I Google and check everything. Three things really struck me. One was to avoid the street kids. Um, the advice was also to watch out for crime. And thirdly, whatever you do, don't go swimming in the Black Sea because it's so heavily polluted. So I'm thinking all these things, and obviously that's me swimming in the Black Sea. Now, in the background, you can see some of the kids. They have my camera, my passport, my wallet. I'm thinking, well, I believe in trust, but this is the point when maybe they run off. I have to go down to a police station in my wet underwear. They'd be like, what happened? Well, I gave my stuff to some street kids, went swimming. What could go wrong? But of course, that is the wonderful thing about trust, is when you give it, you tend to get it back. So, in fact, what was happening is one of the young kids, Lilik, had my camera, and he was walking up and down the beach, and I watched him, and he stamped. And when he stamped, the seagulls would take off, and then he would take a photograph. And this boy was like 13, 14 years old, and I remember thinking, all the others were just taking funny pictures of each other, but he had an idea, he had a vision of something he wanted to create, was making that happen and then photographing it. I thought that's a real photographer. He had a real eye and a real talent. That evening, um, I went back to the squat with them. This is Lilik with his girlfriend, Rusella. And I said to Lilik, when I get back to London, I'm gonna buy you a camera, I'm gonna send it out here, and I want you to start photographing your own life. And he was so excited. I don't know if anyone had ever bought him anything or ever encouraged him to do anything. The next day, I said I'd pop back on my way to the airport, that I'd pop in and say goodbye. When I turned up the next morning, um, Lilik was dead. That night, Roussel had found him in the bed next to her. He was cold, um, probably maybe taking too many pills or vodka, the damp, the cold, a combination of all those things. But the police came, they took his body, and they dumped it in an unmarked grave outside the city. Because to most people, his life is worthless. To most people, his life meant nothing. But that's why I do what I do. Because to me, every story is important. Every story is as important as the stories in this room and the stories of my own family. Um, 
it was while doing this kind of work, I was in Afghanistan um, a year later, in 2011. I was documenting the impact of war on a group of American soldiers. Um, we were ambushed, and as we were moving away, I stepped on a landmine. I lost both my legs and my arm. I remember lying there. It was a beautiful day. Um, I was under a tree. I remember the birds singing. I remember the blue sky. This is a photograph taken in those moments. I thought they would be the last moments of my life. But miraculously, um, I was rescued, I was taken, and I survived. Um, I was flown back to hospital in Birmingham. I spent the next 46 days in intensive care. Um, at the end of that, I was moved to a high dependency unit. I spent pretty much a year in hospital, 37 operations. I was told I'd never walk again, I would never ever work again, and probably have to live with a carer for the rest of my life. But I want to tell you something really remarkable. Three days after I was injured is when I was flown back to the UK. My family was told I was going to die in the next day or so. As they wheeled me in from the, um, from the airport into the hospital, I was unconscious, I was on all these drugs. But my sister said, he's trying to say something. And I said, no, he can't. He's out. He said, she said, you don't know my brother, he's trying to say something. So they took the Austrian mask off. My sister leant over. And my poor sister, I'm sure she was expecting me to say, I love you, or I'm sorry. But the only words that came out were, I am still a photographer. And I believe that is what kept me alive. From that moment, I always believed I would find a way to take photographs again. Three months after I was injured, I was well enough to have a shower for the first time. It was the first time they put me in a wheelchair. I was taken to have this shower, and I saw myself in a mirror for the first time. And I was so repulsed. I saw my missing limbs, the scars across my body, and I really was sickened by my own image. And I went to bed that night, and I remember crying myself to sleep and thinking, I wished I'd just died in Afghanistan. I remember thinking, I didn't want a life where I couldn't walk, a life where I couldn't work. Everything I valued had been taken away from me. But the next morning, I woke up, and something had clicked in my mind. And I made a decision there and then. I said, I will never think about what I can't do, but I will focus on what I can, and I will excel at that. And I knew the first thing I needed to do was confront how I felt about myself. And what's the best way to do that? Photography. So my friend Simon, he came to the hospital. Um, he literally broke me out of the hospital, and we went to his photographic studio. We might have gone via the pub. But we got to a studio, and I wanted to do a self-portrait. As I say, I, I was repulsed by the way I looked. I remember if my friends came around, I would cover up my arm or cover up my, my legs. And I thought, there's only one way I can do this. And I kept thinking of Roman and Greek statues and how if you go to the museum, even though they're missing parts, you see the beauty that is there. And so I did this self-portrait. And this was the moment I said to the world, I do not care. I am what I am. Inside, I'm exactly the same person. In fact, maybe I'm a bit better, a bit stronger, a bit more focused. And this was the moment I took control of my own story. And this was the moment I truly was a photographer again. I went back to hospital. Um, as I say, I was there for a year, 37 operations. But by the end of that year, I was able to begin my rehabilitation. Um, they finally taught me how to walk again. They also taught me how to make strange grimacing faces. And eventually, I figured out ways to hold a camera and to take photographs again.